Hello, and thanks for joining Friday Live right here on the Walt Weekly Podcast. You know, we had initially planned to try to discuss a lighter topic, but, you know, let me say we must keep it real. We've got to keep it real. I'm here with Michelle Sweeney McCombs, and again, my name is Walter Latham. And the topic today is the struggle continues until final victory. All right, and remember, you know, remember that. We used to say this during the 70s and 80s when we would greet someone and we would say, yeah, bro, what's up, man? How you doing? The struggle continues into a final final victory, my brother. That's what we used to say. But there was no truer f- phrase or moniker or saying than the struggle continues. But that only goes to show you that we cannot stand down. The struggle continues until final victory. Remember that. You know, the conviction of Derek Sharman in the George Floyd murder was the beginning of our struggle to right the wrongs of over 400 years of oppression, murder, maiming, and beatings. And so don't be fooled, my friends. Stay ready. Stay vigilant. All right? Think of Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin. They are all martyrs. We have discussed on previous shows, you know, how to remediate this police brutality and the structural racism in this country against blacks and brown people. So, you know, I did a little digging, and this is something that I found, and I'm going to tee it up as I normally would do. Right, throughout history, police forces in the U.S. have been predominantly white, <laughs> and that's no surprise. In 2016, the most recent year, which we, you know, we, we got data for that's available, about 72% of local police officers were white and nearly 88% were male. And this is according to the Bureau of Justice. About 64% were both white and male and about 11% were black. So a profile largely unchanged since 1997. And there's a new a newer study out that came out in February, and this is coming out from the Journal of Science. They found that Hispanic and black officers use less force than white officers against people of color. And you know, I think that 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 stems from they understand their own. There's a connection there. And the same as white people, cops have with white people. So the struggle continues until final victory. You know, I had mentioned last week, I believe, that, you know, we should have a purge to address this issue, a purge in the, dep- in the police department. But then we talked about unions and that, that, that blue line and all that kind of stuff, which allows these cops to go out there with impunity and not have to worry about repercussions. So we will discuss the justice made it out to Derek Sharman and the rapidity of incidents before and after his conviction. And with that, and without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. Awesome, that was great, Walter. And thank you everyone for joining the Walt Weekly Friday Live. Friday Live is sponsored by Beauty Blends by Ami, Soap and Love, and Michelle Sweeney Hair. Our intro and outro music is provided by Uncle Nephew. I will post their websites and social media pages in the chat room. Today we have our normal panel joining us from Washington, D.C., Ernest J. Robinson, Sergeant, U.S. Marine Corps Combat Veteran, Senior Consultant at B. Ernest Leadership and Professional Consulting. We also have Christopher Sweeney out of New Jersey, a retired sanitation worker, and CEO of Johnny Roof's Catering Services. We will have Greg Coleman joining in. He just texted me out of North Carolina, COO of Illumination Media and Technology and Engineer 
at the Walt Weekly. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat room, and we will address them appropriately. Thank you. Back to Walt. Back to you, Walter. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. All right. So, guys. Got the props back. Awesome. <laughs> so, guys, uh, with Derek Chauvin uh, being found guilty on all charges, you know, what, what, what do you feel about that? Chris? Well, <clears throat> um, I feel great about it. It's a fantastic thing. I Sometimes I still got to, I still wake up and got to pinch myself on this one. Even though to anybody, this should have been the obvious one. But we were, we were sitting on pins and needles waiting for that, uh, conviction to come down for that for that verdict to come out and right. you know i i breath you know took a, a breath of relief because you know i'm gonna be honest i did i didn't have confidence in it i i thought it was i thought it wasn't going to play out in, in in the family's favor and i'm very grateful well, yeah that it did. one one jury for it to be a hung jury right one guy to hold out and i yes. expected that I, that's what yes. i expected mm-hmm Right. That's that's what I'm saying. It it, it could have, uh, you know, they put the seed of doubt out there, you know, the, the drugs, all kinds of things, the heart condition. You just right. needed one person to say, hey, I understand. I relate to that. So mm-hmm. it was very, very close. But once they came back as fast as they did on the second day, I right. said, wow, we may have a conviction here. Right. And um uh, I'm very happy about it. I'm still waiting on the sentencing. I want to see what that looks like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because the sentencing is truly the second leg to the the, to the verdict. Right. Because you got to send a message to the rest of these people out there that this is not going to be tolerated. You know, we had enough. It's destroying the country. It's ripping communities apart. It's leaving families without loved ones. And enough is enough. So I'm hoping that the judge really comes down hard on him, sends a message that this is not what we're about. And enough is enough. All right. Ernest. Yeah. No, I one not I completely agree um with with Chris. Um because the part of the the, the, agree, the most egregious part of the criminal justice system is not only the convictions, but it, it does become the sentencing. Um, you know, a uh, unrelated case um, right. has nothing to do with um, uh, killing, but the, the Stanford swimmer who was convicted of rape, who got six months. Mm. Um, and I think three months was suspended. And where he did his three months at home uh, with the ankle bracelet on. So the mm-hmm. yeah, but so so that I mean, so Chris is Chris was dead on with with the fact of of the sentencing because yeah, because so he's he's been convicted, but does he get the minimum of each of those particular counts? Is any of those particular counts going to be suspended? Um, I like. I like Chris and, and, and many others had my doubts uh, about it just because I've seen the way that it works. But one thing that my professor um, has shared with me when I was in, in school um, was that we only have just the one system. So we need to we need to be able to believe in the system. Now, there's things that we need to do to correct how it works. It, you know, but we only have but this one. Until we come up with another one, this is all that we got. So we, we got to make it. Work. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, um, oh. I agree with what they both said. My feelings as well. Um, I had my doubts. I knew he would get convicted because all of the evidence evidence pointed to it. So there was no way around it. I think having all of the uh, cameras that were full circle. You had the people with the cameras, you had the stores with the cameras. There was no way that this man was going to get off. But what I was surprised about was that he got, he was guilty on all counts. That was a shock to me. So, you know, I pretty much had a feeling that he would get charged, but I didn't think he would get all of the charges. So that, that's, 
uh, you know, one for the books for our history. Oh yeah, yeah, I don't know that. And that. And I, I also think, like, to you know, that if it wasn't for those, I don't think they. I think he probably could have still gotten convicted, but not on all of the charges. Right. I think that the the evidence in this particular situation was overwhelming. It was. Um, yeah. That it there was no there was no way for you to not turn between, like you said, between the, the phone cameras, the street cameras, the you know the body cameras that was actually right. on the officers, the every account from the the nine one one phone calls, yes, the coroners, the medical examiners, EMT. Yeah. It was overwhelming. Overwhelming. We didn't have those these particular individuals uh, uh, or information available during the Breonna Taylors, right. the Trayvon Martins. And everything else, and so you all you had was audio in one situation or right. or in another situation. So, um, but that's that being said, in the past we we've had what was considered to be overwhelming, you know, uh, mm-hmm. evidence, and still not get convicted because it, we had yeah. the Rodney King, which was oh, clear yes. as day. And and right. that still was, you know, the, so it, it, the, the, there's a precedent that is set when it comes down to convictions. And there's been a precedent set when it comes down to sentencing. I think that this was the right step when it comes down to convictions. Right. And I think that, again, to Chris's point, the next step is going to be what's coming down when it comes down to these convictions. Right. Um, and then there's a couple other things I'm going to have to end up doing, but you know, I, I digress for the moment. Right, right. right. Well, and also I also want to add. Civil war and they didn't want a civil war. In any right. Time. I, I also add. Yeah, I wanted to say that like the people of Minnesota are exhausted with this too. Like, right. That place has been a hotbed for these incidents over the last few years, and it it comes to a point where even the citizens are exhausted. They're, they're tired. Yeah. And it wasn't just that, you know, the evidence was right. They put the right uh, uh, the prosecutor in place. The, uh, yes. the, the governor uh, put, um, what's his name in? You know who I'm talking about, the attorney general yes. in right. place. They, they, they did, it from top to bottom, every step that needed to take place in this case to get a conviction or to even get a fair trial was taken. Right. In the Breonna yeah. Taylor case, the the attorney general withheld stuff, so you don't you know we don't know that there wasn't this kind of overwhelming evidence because they didn't release everything, they didn't tell mm. us everything. This time in this case, everything was released, and I also want to say, is the system really flawed, or is it just the people that are applying the system that are flawed? It's, it's not it's the, the system. It's the people yeah. applying the system. Right. It's the people right. in Absolutely. place. It's the attorney. That's why voting matters. That's why being involved in these local elec- elections matter because these uh, right. these district attorneys, these um, all of these people that are in these places, a lot of them are in bed with the police unions. They right. they don't bring out you know they don't put the pressure on the police the way they need to, and it's not an attack on every cop. So they use these tools to say, oh, we, we're attacking police. No, we're attacking Derek Chauvin, who committed right. that crime. Nobody said anything else about any other officer because nobody else put their knee on George Floyd's neck. It was about mm-hmm. him and him mm-hmm. alone. And we have to stop allowing the police department to make it a... It, 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 uh, an indictment of the entire police department right. every time somebody, a bad apple, a bad seed, does something. If you work on your job and you do something wrong, they don't fire the entire staff. They get rid of right. you. Right. That's that, and that's what we got to start doing. They got to go. Well, okay. I, well, first of all, even, well, to that point, I mean, I, I'll push back a little bit because if. You're doing something. If you stole from your job 
and the job finds out that you knew that the other dude stole too and you ain't say nothing they firing you too so mm. if you watching someone commit murder then you should be held liable maybe not to the same degree right. But there's a level of culpability. And I think in, in a lot of many, in many cases, there's a lot of culpability that I think that we all have within our neighborhoods by the no snitching, by the no this, the no that, the what happens in our house stays in our houses. Why we had the conversation about domestic violence. Right. Because we become complicit with our own silence. You are absolutely right. Hold the bad apple accountant. Uh, uh, accountable, but if right. every but if there's a couple apples that are spoiled because of that bad apple, we not they not gonna stay in the bunch either. Right. I mean, there's well, some three, there's some fruit those you three can are salvage, up next, right? No, the yeah. the three You'd of them right. that the other guys are up next. But I'm talking right. about yeah. the police officers that were not there. You weren't there, right. absolutely. So don't take it personal because yes. we're not talking yes. to you. It's not directed to you. The union spin it, they spin the narrative to make it seem like you're attacking everybody. That yeah, you know, if yeah. you were sleeping in your bed and you were off duty, I'm not talking to you. Right, right, all right. But I do want to go on a little bit here because uh, we got a long ways to go. But first off, I, I do want to. I hope that the George Floyd family and friends uh, find some closure. All right, it helps with some, you know, closing this on their side. Uh, you know, my condolences, and I hope y'all guys do find some closure. But that just is a that's a segue into my next question, and that is, you know, what I don't get is why people are celebrating. I mean, it, it, this was an arrogant it's act. Not over. This was an arrogant act. I mean, it's out there in the public, is as if saying, okay, here. You know, uh, you know, I'm 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 a I'm a sexual predator. So here, I'm gonna stand up here and I'm with no clothes on. All right. I mean, that is the level of, of arrogance of the violence per perpetrated against George Floyd. This was an arrogant act, and it was very clear. Yeah. It was it was Neanderthal, mm -hmm. and, and and if you can compare it to that, it was the guys are dead going Neanderthal. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I don't see, and we don't have time to celebrate. But we do have time to honor the family and hope they find some type of closure. Okay. Right. And, right. and, and, and this, this verdict. All right. Um, uh, I'm happy, uh, for the Floyd family with the justice. They, they, and they deserve it. They deserve everything, but let's move forward. All right. There's other incidents. And I understand that the, uh, the Biden justice, justice department is overseeing and investigating the Minneapolis police department. So they are, wow. they, 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 are, they, are, they are. Uh, and this is something that was started under President Obama, but I believe Chicago. But this is yeah. something that needs to be widespread nationwide. Of Investigation course. of all these shootings, everything, all this violence that's, that's being, being uh, directed towards minority people, they all should be investigated. I mean, all the police and departments, need, regardless. And, and, and we need to get some fruits from that investigation, you know? Not just mm. do these investigations and say you didn't find much or you didn't find any civil rights violations. You know, you're just wasting taxpayer money doing these investigations. Right. And we know there is a problem. And you keep coming back saying that there isn't a problem. So hopefully they'll do that. And I also want to say, hopefully the young lady that recorded that video, they take good care of that young lady because she put her life on the line. Because she's been getting yeah, death threats and all kinds of things. And she, she held her ground. And all of the witnesses, they all held all their ground. Them, all and they should all be applauded and protected. Yes, because they did, they did a great service. Yeah. You heard about a couple it? of states. You know, at least, you know, that leads up to some states are trying to block uh, private uh, people from taking videos of cops and why they're performing their duties. Y'all guys heard about that? They're trying to pass laws that's, against that's, videotaping cops they, while they, they're. Uh, in they've been trying to do that. Anytime, yeah. anytime that something where it is uh, favorable towards minorities, they they'll they'll change it. You know, 
it, it wasn't like it, it was all minorities who who put forward the body cams. Body cams were, in a sense, supposed to be able to help tell the story for police. <clears throat> now they're hurting police, and now they want to stop people. From, it it it's they're, they're just being fickle about uh, about the situation. Um, right. Yeah, but the thing is, is that with the technology that we have out there now, you know, without that, you can imagine what's been going on. And and if they try to take that away, I mean, mm-hmm. that there you go. You got that impunity thing. Oh, well, nobody's watching me, so let me do this and let me do that. Right, but that but it, that, that goes back into what Chris was sitting there saying about the whole thing with voting, which is the reason why they're trying to, I mean, granted, we're not talking about voting this time, but this is why all this stuff ties in together. It plays in, yes. To over two, right, over 200 plus, 300 plus uh, bills are trying to be passed to try to suppress voting right now. One of the things, if they suppress voting, one of the things they'll be able to pass is being able to to stop private citizens from being able to record police. Which is something that's going to negatively impact the the, the black and brown communities or or, or 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 people of lower lower incomes because of of bad police practicing. There will be other things that they could pass throughout. The, I mean, so again, registering to vote, actually going to vote, being involved in, involved in in what policies are are being made. Again, to I think to your point. Uh, about the you know why celebrate you know I mean, or why so much celebration right you know really look into and read how these laws and policies are constructed who's sitting down on the task force if there isn't a task force go to your city council board of supervisors your general assembly go to the they come here to dc capitol hill and tell them to put together a task force Put together a group of people who are interested, like-minded, to being able to to structure a policy and propose that as a draft, and then support it all the way until it becomes a law, all the way through. And 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 that's but but that's was but that's how this stuff happens, and and the way that we protect ourselves is by by remaining vigilant so to your point not not don't get so caught up in the celebration remain vigilant remain on top remain informed remain you went on mute Ernest. yeah basically don't go to sleep yes absolutely yeah yeah don't get comfortable hey welcome gene i I had i had a conversation with with somebody the other day about not celebrating there's no time to celebrate and they said, well, aren't we, shouldn't we sell, we could do both. I said, yeah. And she said, she commented and said, well, wasn't it a uh, celebration worthy when the, the, the slaves were freed? I said, yeah, look at what happened. We celebrated in Jim Crow. So you, there's no time to sleep. There's no rest. You know, you can't rest with this. You know, you got Tucker Carlson on, on Fox going crazy oh over the gosh. trial and the verdict. And mm-hmm. that's not that's not to to influence the Chauvin case. That's to influence the next case that's next coming case. up with right. the lady. They do all of these things are planned. This is not by an accident mm-hmm. that he's on TV having a conniption over this over this verdict. They all they all expected Chauvin to go to jail. This that that performance was for the next cop that's on trial. Cause not right. well, that was, that performance was for the audience that that looks at Fox. Yeah, you know what right. I mean. Because none of them, if you polled them, none of them thought that the police was guilty. You know, that's just another uh, n-word mm-hmm. person killed to them. Right. All right? Right. right. They don't look right. at black people as a hundred percent, you know, human. So yeah, you know so. that what that is. Yeah. Yeah, they so just right playing it to the audience on that one. It's true. True. But so he is right playing now, to the audience, but he's playing for the next case too. He, you know, Tucker Carlson's an intelligent guy. It's for rate. It's a ratings grab. And it's also to say, look, the cops can't get a fair trial because we got right. several cases coming up behind it. Well, then they need to cut a deal. Don't even waste your time going to trial. Cut a deal. You know, you're guilty. Nah, no, nah, nah, they're not because they figured they got nah, the upper nah, hand nah, all really. these years. They've been yeah. drinking at the trial. You know, they had the trial. They drinking, drinking, drinking. 
and uh, you know they're not and, and they don't have to pay. It's like getting getting free yeah. electricity. You know, I I yep, got it, but it, I don't have to pay. Shot. That's yeah, it. They taking a shot. The police union would never say, "Oh no no no, take it to trial," because the odds are in their favor. Absolutely. But I think what what the tipping point was when other police testified that this is not the way to do it. Right. That broke the boat there. That 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 sunk the ship. That Whatever the shows you how had, egregious it that, was. that sunk it. Yeah. Exactly. That said, exactly. You know, how egregious it was. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely. So right now I'd like to take a second. We have Honorable Jean Anthony Edwards, male district leader, 79th district from the Bronx that has joined in as well. Yeah, Jane, can you can you come on? All right, no, we wait for Jane. Oh, hey, how's everybody doing, family? Hey, hey, how you doing? What's up, big bro? Little bro, in my well, case. There you go. Okay, good, good. All right. Yeah, oh, you been following with, right following now? us, Jane? He just joined in, so you might not have heard everything. So. Yeah, I just joined like a couple of minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were talking about you know off. the. Are you talking about the? Uh, yeah. We're Chatham. talking, yeah, and not that we can't stand on that and celebrate. We got to keep moving. Oh yeah, well, yeah, Jay, mm-hmm. right now, um, yeah, I'm here. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm more I'm I'm following the uh, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. You know, um, uh, he says something rather profound, not so much in his press conference, right? Because we've, we've heard that narrative before, but he actually did a one-on-one interview with uh, the White House correspondent from ABC News, Pierre Thomas. And uh, he was moved to tears when he talked about how his grandparents had to flee Europe because the uh, Jews were being persecuted and how America took in his family and treated him well. And he started crying because he's basically saying, you know, um, the uh, same plights that black people have in America were the same plights that Jews were facing in uh, Europe. And um, he wants to do something about it. And he started, he was moved to tears. So I want to see what's behind those tears. You know, right now, He's launching an investigation into the Minnesota Police Department, not just Minneapolis, but the entire state. And um, let's see what that investigation yields, because we we've we've been down this road before. Well, I should say road, but this this is not our first rodeo. But let's see if if Merrick really puts down the hammer on, uh, you know, uh, bad policing or or bad policing practices. I should say, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So, um, you know, we have a lot of murders that are still outstanding. That you know, there's there's been no accountability uh, for. Uh, we all, you know, we got Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, Charvon Martin. Uh, then we got a new one with Anthony Brown. Then we had Makia Bryant, seventeen year old girl that was. You know, that, that was shot by the cops. She was wielding her knife. She, you know, the teenagers were fighting. Uh, the name only a few. And what, what, what are y'all guys, you know, what, do you, what is your take on that? And let me, let me start with Gene. Can you yeah, hear I can hear you. Yeah. yeah, did you hear my um, question? Yeah, I've been, I've, yes, I heard it. I've been going at it on Facebook with uh, some former colleagues that were like former prosecutors because, you know, I worked for the, DA here in Bronx County. And, you know, some court officers here in the Bronx have chimed in. And, you know, it, it was it was a healthy and respectable debate. It's still going on. You know, Walter, this is what I had mentioned to you prior to the show that you get a chance to go to my Facebook page and check out the thread. Now, uh, last year, there was an attempted assault right in front of the courthouse. Teenagers, 16-year-olds, 16, 17-year-olds, same age as the young people that were fighting um, that led to the young ladies, uh, no, not young lady, she was 16, 17, she's still a child, which led to that child's death. Right. And in it, it was a kid walk, walking down the street with a backpack, and there were three other teenagers that approached him. 
and one pulled out a butcher knife that he had on his person, right? And attempted to stab the uh, one kid that had the backpack in his back. The only thing that saved him was that the kid with the backpack was trying to run inside the courthouse. And as he approached the front entrance, somebody pushed the door open. He fell back and the knife got stuck in his backpack. Otherwise, he'd have been stabbed in the kidneys. I watched mm. five court officers run out of that room like they were Michael Johnson in the 1996 Olympics, okay? And they chased <laughs> him down like they had on gold shoes, right? Caught all three yeah. kids, wow. right? And um, wow. and because I was a witness to the crime, you know, I had to speak to the attorneys that were in family court. And I'm saying this to say that there was an attempted assault that happened. Like he actually stabbed the kid, but the butcher knife went into the backpack. Those court officers never fired a shot. Nobody ever even pulled out a gun. They chased those kids down, even the one that had the knife. Because after he stabbed the kid, he pulled the knife out. He still had the knife when he was running down the street. And two court officers caught him and tackled him and, and placed him into custody. I saw this with my own eyes and had to testify to so to the prosecutor in family court. So, you know, if, if, if court officers that normally don't have to deal with this, if they can manage to keep their composure and make the arrest and not shoot, then how come officers that deal with violent crime on a routine basis, why couldn't they maintain their person? That, that, that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I don't that's understand. That's my argument. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would say that every single case there's not as clear as the as the previous case. Majority of those cases that that we that we just mentioned, the they did not need to utilize deadly force. It, there there could have been alternative methods um, to being able to approach the case. This last situation with the young lady, um, and and I don't call anyone who's 17 years old a child. I was 17 years old when I went to the Marine Corps. And I would dare someone to call me a child, you know, if I'm able to serve my country. However, I digress. But also someone who's a- able and willing to attempt to do severe bodily harm and or cause death to another person has, you know, has some level of their own personal responsibility to the situation. I typically do not watch um, the the killings of, of anybody, but I needed to watch this so I could be clear about what um, my perspective of it versus just what I heard people talking right. about because the descriptions that people were giving were far, far different than what was actually taking place in the actual right. video itself. Mm-hmm. The police officer pulled up. He did not have his weapon drawn at first. He came out and he actually asked what, what the heck was going on? Why, what's happening? Who called? Whatever. In seconds, two girls fall to the ground. One girl is over the car Another girl who's holding the knife about to stab somebody, he right. neutralizes the situation. There wasn't much time to being able to. We can all sit back and I've had to, to utilize my weapon and in, in uh, pull my weapon in some situations where I did not have to use it. But I had enough time to being able to do so in that situation when you're trying to, in this case, preserve life, not take a life. Because that young lady, her life was being threatened at that time, at that point. The one in the pink. Yeah. Okay. And and so it it's so it's so it's not as clear, but I definitely do agree that there are some alternative ways in many of those other cases where deadly force was not necessary, was not and the, the excuse about getting confused with the taser, that's ridiculous. Oh, forget that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, yeah. Charged. That's, yeah, that's, charge. Oh yeah, yeah. She yeah. was charged, and uh, you know, sorry, in a jumpsuit, you know, taking a photo. I mean, yeah. that was quick, you know. But 
this one with with the seventeen year old girl lunging towards uh, someone and the officer shooting her four times. You know, I have some reservations about that. Like, you know, for instance, I don't know whether there should be a closer look at that. I just can't jump to you know a conclusion that the officer acted. You now, I think he, to me, he, he he did what he had to do to try to save the girl. I mean, it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one. You know, I leave that up so, in the air so, a little bit. So, so matter of fact, I'll, 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 I'll keep Chris? it clear. Hold, hold, hold on. Let, 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 I'll say this real quick. So I always use the escalation of force continuum, right? In right. any time that there's a wrongful death or whatever it me, I use the escalation of force continuum because that is what is trained and taught across the board. All right. The only time deadly force is supposed to be used is when lethal force is imminent and present. That in this situation, by the book, if you if you can anybody can Google it, look it up to the letter of the law. This was done by the book the way that it's that it's the way that it's spelled out. Because someone's life, either the officer, the the uh the assailant, or the victim's life, it has to be an imminent threat. And that was her life was in imminent danger at that particular point. It is by the book. All right, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm so it's so hard for me to equate that with other uh, situations, you know, that we that we have concern with. Uh, Chris, what are you? What are your thoughts oh, on I that? Have, I have a question, Walter. I have a question, <laughs> Walter. I have a question for Ernest. Ernest, you don't think four shots was excessive? No, so here's the thing. And you're you're you 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 can always sit there and say that maybe he he because so, so we use a double tap right two shots right but it, he didn't he didn't empty the clip like they did with with was it Michael Bell in in New York with the forty one shots and right. you know and, and entire clips and stuff like that he neutralized the situation that was right there in front of him so to your point yes maybe he could have only shot her twice versus shooting her four times. Right. I mean, I, I, could, he, I mean, what if he, he could have hit the young lady he was trying to save as well? I mean, that was excessive. He could have. No, no, I mean, no, he, Michelle, 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 there's a reason why yeah. I pose this question for Ernest and, and, and Ernest only because the, the, the first report that came out was that the, the officer was shop involved in the shooting. He was no. They said he was military military trained. They didn't say sharpshooter at first. They said military trained. And the reason why I asked Ernest is because, like Ernest, I too am military trained, and I've been trained in yep. combat because I went to Iraq for three tours. And there's a certain way you shoot. Like Ernest said, you do the double tap in the army and the navy. You fire three, and then you advance and assess the carnage, and then you make an assessment. Whether you should continue to fire, yeah. or whether the uh, or, or whether the threat is down, you take three shots and then you advance and assess. Mm -hmm. So if this guy was military trained, why did he have to shoot four times? Why not double tap like in the army or take three shots in advance like the navy? Who was he trained by? The air mm -hmm. force or the or the coast guards? This is what I want to know because he didn't he didn't have my military training. Well, it should be the police academy, right? And then ongoing training from there, right? right. Or, or does he, that he gets, or is that in know, line he, with the the military? He gets training? retrained by the even though he was trained in the military, he's supposed to be retrained by the, the police department to their standards. Yeah, right. but it, so but also I mean, what to, are the to, police to be, department standards? Yeah, I'm about to say to, to be fair, every every person that's in the military one does not qualify with a handgun. I know in the in the Marine Corps, everyone qualifies at least with a rifle, but everyone does not carry a handgun, nor does have to qualify with a handgun, whether the nine mil, forty five, whatever have you. Uh, Gene's point is still correct. I mean, whether what whatever we're shooting, at, whatever threat that we're trying to neutralize, let me put it that way, whatever threat is trying to be neutralized, there is a certain way that you engage the, the that particular threat. To his point. Granted, if he took one additional shot, I don't. Th I don't think that we have to argue about whether or not if he took, you know, because it was maybe one more shot or two more shots than than may have been necessary 
to actually neutralize the, the situation. To Michelle's point, yes. Anytime a, a firearm is disarmed, is discharged, excuse me, it, there's a the potential threat of it of you know a, a stray bullet happening. But he had a very tight tight engagement, and that that wasn't the issue. Right. But, right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah I mean, it, okay. Greg is. I just want to say. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. And and you know. This was a tough case, tough one for me because he had to, you know, react quickly, right? You know, I, I'd hoped that a taser could have been used, but he probably too far away from her. And mm -hmm. the young lady, to my understanding, was 16, right? Mm -hmm. So she is a child. Let's be mindful of that. Two, I believe the police were called on her behalf because they, they came to jump her. Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I think the the, the, the uh, police call yeah. came from her house, either a grandmother from or somebody home, called. Right, because yes. Yes. She, she was being jumped by those individuals. So I don't ever condone anybody using a, a, a knife or whatever, but she was defending herself. I, I know it's hard for the police officer to, you know, make that you know, determination. Yeah. Right. He doesn't he doesn't know. I, I want to lean towards him probably being justified in this case, but I do believe that he, he, he didn't have to shoot four times, especially right. since they exactly. said he was a sniper, he was a sniper, you know, mm -hmm. and he was a, mm -hmm. in a, 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 a good shot. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Enough. Yeah, that's a, a tough, tough one. one. Like it's, I said, I, yeah, I, I can't yeah. say yay or nay on that one. That, that is yeah, she, further investigation. And she, she was protecting herself. I mean, these kids yeah, but he are, wouldn't know on, that. Wait, 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 no, wait, 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 no, because here's his thing. How can you, if, if, if someone came to your house to harass you now, granted, I understand that, uh, again, many of us lived in, in certain areas, certain neighborhoods, and there's a certain way you carry yourself and certain way that we do things in certain neighborhoods, but that is not a legal recourse. If you were in your home, why in the world were you outside, right. Ernest? I'm not saying. And how, it was a and legal how else would you have recourse, even gotten the knife? But I'm just, I know, hold, hold on. on. How Ernest, else would you? Have... You guys have to excuse yeah, no, excuse no, the static because we are live. So uh, excuse the static, but we are live. Chris, yeah, Chris. Hey, Chris, Chris, say that. Say that again. Chris, say that again. I, I couldn't hear you. We we don't know whether. How long this has been going on between these between these young ladies? We don't know what took place before she came out with that knife. So I can't say she's right or wrong. I'm just saying she was defending herself. It doesn't mean that I agree with the way she did it. I just, you know, you're right. We've all we all grew up in neighborhoods where you had to fight sometimes. Sometimes you couldn't run you. away from it. You know, well, so I don't want to judge her. Just to, and just to get in a little bit, because we don't know everything. But once the police came on the scene, why didn't she just back down? Like, I'm not making excuses for them. He was excessive. She was already shooting. out of control with that. She, yeah. And uh, uh, but, this is a tough Right. One, but see, but, yeah, right, it is tough. And it, it's tough. It, and, 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 that, and that's the thing. I mean, granted, and Chris, I'm not saying saying that, you know, that uh, right or wrong or this, that way. But the thing is, is that there is a self, a, a sense of self-responsibility. Like no matter what, if you had to go out and fight now, one, most people in the neighborhoods, if you was going to fight and there was OGs in the area, whether the case may be ladies or, you know, older gentlemen, whatever the case may be, y'all two, y'all got in, y'all scrapped and y'all did whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. If, 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 if it came down to uh, whatever, I mean, like she, she escalated, she, she was clearly in the aggress, at, in, no, the aggressor. Was. At yeah. the at the time, yeah, at the time that the police arrived at that situation, right? So like to Michelle's point, it's like I I can't you you want to believe right, and you want to give her the benefit of the doubt, but at the time, if you were being harassed, and one either you called the police, which that wasn't necessarily the case, someone called the police on your behalf because you were being harassed. At that time, you should have allowed for the authorities to step in. But she you're went asking a with 16 deadly year force. Old. Yeah, but, but the guy would not know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Chris, I'm not blaming. 
I just want to add something now. I mean, when you see some of these 16 year old girls, you don't know whether they're 20 they don't look or 21. Yet. You know what I mean? I mean, they're big for the no, age now. I, no, I didn't say she no, was. No, 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 I, no. Walter, thought thought process. Walter, Walter, she's a child Walter, still. This is the thing that this is the thing that bothers me most about you know every like so many opinions I've heard about this this case, this video. Okay, number one, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. the biggest mistake she made was running into the house where it was safe and then coming back out. Whether she had a knife or right. not, she should have never left the house. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I think it was Greg said that, you know, she's 16, she's a child. What is the demographic that we hate most about human beings? Those damn teenagers. They're loud, they're rude, they're unruly, you know, uh, 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 16 year old girls and 16 year old boys, they are a pain in the ass, okay? And the fact that mm -hmm. people expected her to act like a responsible adult, to act like a citizen exactly. of this great republic, she's a typical 16 year old. She probably makes twerk right. videos on TikTok. She thinks Megan Thee Stallion is a freaking, you know, role model. Come on, man. Right. She acted irrationally right. the same way any 16-year-old. And, yes, she did make the call. But once the officers showed up, it's not like her picture was on a 911 call. They didn't know who made right. the phone they call. They went after the one that was the most aggressive. And it was her. Her, right. her only mistake was leaving the house after she went inside for safety. But, again, she was 16. Look, at 16, I ain't want to tell you what I was doing at 16. Cause this is a live broadcast, and, you know. You know uh, oh yeah. You know, just yeah, put it yeah. like this. I was in the projects in the Bronx. You think I was making good decisions? Right. You think I was making right. good decisions right. at sixteen? The best decision but, hold on. that was Nadia ever was made there was when no my parents parent. and me going to the yeah. military. Go ahead. Yeah. The, okay. There, yeah. Go there, ahead. There, there, there's. I, I, I mean, the the thing is, is that I I always try to make sure that to remain objective, right? Yes, I do understand that a 16-year-old mind is still developing in many cases, but I do not want to minimize the value of young people to being able to make smart, good decisions. That that's it's unfair. It's unfair to to that individual or anybody who happens to be the age of 16 or anyone who happens to be 17 or 18 or just to assume that because they're 18, 19 or 20 years old, that they should be so much more advanced. And so the issues that they may, may be having, um, they should not have because of the fact that they are 18. I think sometimes we minimize our own greatness because we're it could because it, 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 there's a level of convenience. No, at 16 years, my, my mother told me that at 13, you are responsible for your own sins. Now, that, granted, that's the household that I grew up in. Maybe other people have heard the same thing. Maybe yes. other people have not. Of right? Course, yeah. The jails but, are filled with 16 year olds who made bad decisions all over the place. Throw in the fact that this, this, she's a foster child, we don't know her mental capacity, anything. I'm not excusing the, her for her behavior. Yes. But I'm also going to try to be mindful here. She's a lot. A lot of 16-year-olds in the foster system are scarred people that make poor yes. decisions and they react yes. because they're emotional. She was being jumped by three people. She probably got out of control. She was angry, and her anger got the best of her. Right. It, it, yeah. it right, let's move on. Amen, but I, I, Amen. And, Amen and, and, and to that, brother. And, and, and go back and forth. Amen and, to that, bro. I agree. That's, that's, the, part, that that's the part that gets locked. Oh, that's the part that gets left out. She came up in the foster care system. We don't know whether her getting drunk uh, uh, triggered triggered PTSD. We don't know anything about that. Nobody's yeah, dealing yeah, with, the, with the whole psychological aspect yeah, and the fact that she came in. The, look, look, DMX was the way he was because his mother dropped him off at the damn foster care place. Remember? He's told that story ad nauseum. His mother took him to a to a to a shelter, a foster home, and said, we're going to visit, and left him. And he grew up. By the time he was 14, he was pulling armed robberies. People cannot discount the, the, the uh, psychological 
fallout with these foster kids. Right, I agree. Right. I agree. I That's know, something I, that we I should wanna, discuss. Yeah, exactly. I want to step in real quick. Shelton in the chat room said, what would be said if she killed the two other girls? It would be a different story. I mean, yeah. She'd be in jail. We, you know. Nobody's she, discounting she, that. I, I agree with the... I, I think the cop had to make a split second decision. Right. Four shots right. was excessive. That I watched the other day a gentleman in a pickup truck ramming his truck into police officers, trying to run him over, hit him. There was mm. an officer holding on to the truck while he sped off. He hit the cop in the head with a hammer. <laughs> the man mm. wasn't touched. The right. man wasn't touched. Nope. And you're they talking know. about nope. police officers whose right. lives were in danger. I right. mean, come on. Right, so right. it's not it's not our fault that we have to question everything because it seems like every time it's somebody black we end up dead and white people do not right. face the dead same thing they have yeah. compassion and they hesitate and they think about it before they react they never think when it's a black children they shoot first that is my problem with them well, I, I think that's a culture. Hey, I think you know it, what? it all goes back hey, to hey, that, hey, that study conducted. Uh, that that, hey, that study that was conducted by the Science Journal. All right, the Journal of Science, where it says that you know black and Latino people, when they encounter criminals that are of the same race or color, they have less incidents of violence than that when a white person you know uh, tries to or attempts to arrest a, a person of color. Because the person of color understands, because they have that background where they can understand situations like that. White guy, white people, they can't. They didn't come from that culture. They don't understand what's going on in the community. That's one big problem that we have, and it's very. It stands out really in New York because I'm, I live the way I live out in where in the burbs. A lot of people out here. I'm seventy miles east of New York. They you got cops that live out here that police in the city, in Brooklyn, Brownsville. They don't know a damn thing about Brownsville. So why in the hell are they in Brownsville? The first black people they ever seen was when they were on the, in the police department. And how they're gonna interact with, with black people or Latino people? Well, well, well Walter, uh, I don't know if you noticed, the uh, biggest story all week long was the active shooter at that stop and shop in West, West Hempstead. Right. And the fact oh, yeah, that he was taken, it. yeah, he was taken into he was taken into custody with uh, no incident, and um, he was a he was a he was a he was a tall brother. He wasn't a big guy, but he was like six four, and he was taken and he he killed one person and injured two others. Uh, he worked there. He shot some of his uh, co-workers. He shot. He killed his manager and injured some of his co-workers, but he was taken in, into custody with no incident. And like that's been the biggest story on the news because that it shows that because it shows that it can be done. Yes, it, it, it can, can be actually done. be done. Yeah. And he suffers from mental illness, so it wasn't like they were talking to a person that you know was going through something. They were talking to somebody that had lost their mind from the time they were born. You know, so it yeah. can be done. De-escalation. Compassion yeah, how do you de-escalate? That That's something like that train up. But I still think they should be purged. All right, there's something else that I want to go into. What about this shooting in Elizabeth City, North Carolina? All right, and then I believe the gentleman's name was uh, Anthony Andrew Brown. Did anybody hear about that shooting? No, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I was reading about that. I think it happened a, a few days ago. But anyway, I was reading about this. They were, uh, and police were attempting to arrest this guy, a potential drug dealer. Uh, you know, but he didn't have a gun, but he wound up dead. Okay. And potential so you got a lot of protests dead. going on in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, where I went to college. Elizabeth City State is the biggest thing in, 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 in Elizabeth City. But uh, you got you got uh, protests going on there. So that's another yeah. guy yeah. that's unarmed yeah. that's, that got shot, you know. And, uh, you know, it's I, I know, like I said, it's a nationwide problem, you know, with these cops. And we can't. And I'm going to use it. 
you know, stand back, stand down for now. But we got to continue to fight. Now use one of Trump's words, you know, just stand by. All right. And, and continue to fight. I mean, we can't let our guards down on this. We can't. Right. We can't, people. George, that that verdict is not <clears throat> over. That it's just one of the battle, a skirmish. That's basically what it was. It's mm. a skirmish. If you look wow. at the overall picture, if you look at the, look at it holistically, mm -hmm. all right, we are in a war. All right, for our rights, for our, for equality. Okay, and so this here segment, or this here slice of the pie, okay, is the policing piece. But you got the hot, the medical piece. <clears throat> you got the the the, the, uh, the justice piece. You got so many different pieces that make up this pie. And this is just one part. And we got the education piece. I mean, there's we got so much going on that we have we have to dedicate ourselves to. One, being on alert, one, being relentless, one, always going forward, all right? We have to. We can't just take this for granted and say, okay, well, the U.S. woman was convicted. I mean, uh, the uh, it, uh, Derek Sherwin was convicted. So, yeah, okay, let's go and uh, let's move on to something else. We cannot. How many times are we going to circle back to this? We're going in circles. Right. That's the way it looks to me. It seems to me. I've been around a long time. I remember one time uh, growing up down south in North Carolina, and I was about 11 years old, I guess. You know how you have these, uh, when they dig out, they put a foundation and water accumulates in this big hole that they create. So me and my friends had nothing to do where I was, you know, like 1,500 people lived in the town. And in the summer, it's hot as hell, no swimming pool, no public swimming pool because of segregation. So we see this this little water standing in this little pool and we jumped up, took our clothes off, the little boys. And we started swimming in there. The cops come. Mm. All right? They pull up. All right? And we started going underwater. <laughs> you know, we were swimming underwater so they wouldn't see us. So what I'm saying, if you don't bring your ass out of there, and I'm quoting, all right? I mean, I'm you know, it's paraphrasing, but basically, you don't come out of there, I'm going to stick this stick up your ass. Wow. All right, so we got scared then. So we came up, man. You know, and the thing is, they did not allow us to put on our clothes. They put us in the back of the squad car. They didn't cuff us, but they wouldn't allow us. It was about four of us. They put us in the back of the squad car, didn't allow us, took us downtown, no clothes. We had our clothes in our hand, and they took us into the police they, on the way, though. They mm -hmm. said, we should take your niggas out. To this particular area, this I Highway 64, yeah. and ha and kill your ass, and nobody mm -hmm. will ever find you. That's what they right. said to us. These are white cops yeah. talking to little kids. Mm -mm. All right, you guys were fortunate. We damn well sure was. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, when we get down to the police station, I'm crying, and I'm just saying, don't tell my mama. That's the most important thing to me. Wow. All the other wow. stuff was like, I didn't give a damn. As long right. as you don't tell my mama, you know what I mean? Because I know I've got a <laughs> whooping coming, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm crying. So finally, get there, one black cop, all right, in the town. So he was there. They called him, and he took out that police belt, and he beat the, beat the shit out of every one of us. What? On the backside. Yeah. He wow. beat us. You know, not on the on the back, on, on the you know, like uh, he gave yeah. us a whooping with a big police belt. I mean, okay, I want my uncle, was it? <laughs> he may have been. Was it my I mean, uncle? I don't know whether <laughs> your uncle or not, but you know, I'm not gonna say his name. He was the only black sheriff in Bertie County. No, 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 no. This is in Martin County. It's in Wilson. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. I mean, okay. No, I'm glad it wasn't your uncle. He was bigger. I mean, I think the other guy was just a big. <laughs> All right, so, you know, I mean that day, but I was every time he would hit me, I said, "Don't tell my mama, please, please, please." <laughs> I was more scared of my mom than I was of him. Of him, wow. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, you know, to get back, um, yeah, I mean, we 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 got we got a fight on our hands, and we just can't lie down. We can't we cannot afford to. All right. So with that said, you know, we we still got a little time in the few things I want to cover is that 
there is a police academy at Lincoln College in uh, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. All right, and it's an HBCU. So they're training police cadets. They're the first historically black college and university in this country to do so. Now, do you think that's something that should be spread out to you know to other uh, HBCUs as part of the curriculum, working with the department, the police department, to further integrate or accelerate integration of the police department? Y'all guys think that's a good idea? Absolutely. Yeah. I, well, I, well, Virginia Union actually 100%. has a, a, a. We actually have a partnership with the Richmond Police Department. Their their police academy, uh, one is right across the street from Virginia Union, but it was, I, I don't remember the whole story. It was sold, donated to Richmond uh, Police Department, and we hold our classes. Um, in 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 that academy to being able to bridge that gap uh, between the policing and the students. And Jane, I uh, unmuted myself. Oh, okay. But this thing's showing mute on mine. Excuse me. Yeah. What do you think about you know the HBCUs taking over or uh, playing some part in the recruitment of police police officers? Of course, they. they they should be involved. I mean, after all, they have the Army recruiters on the campus of HBCUs. Yes, yes, absolutely. Anything that will help police community relationships, anything that will improve police practices, yes, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Okay, okay. All right. Chris, did you want to say anything about that? No, I think it's an outstanding right. idea. Uh-huh. Go go with it. I mean, we gotta we gotta start, you know, taking responsibility for our communities as well. We need people that look like us to police us, so and that live life. yeah, that live where we live or lived where we live, and yeah. share our experiences. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. The, the only problem I would, yeah. well, the, the only problem I would see with you know the HBCUs and police recruitment. Um, typically, young people don't go to college and graduate in with the idea or design of becoming a police officer. They normally have designs on, you know, moving on further to a specialized education, whether it's an MBA, law school, medical school, you know, CPA, things of that nature. So um, I don't know whether they should be going after like, you know, so much the college graduates, but more so maybe the ones that have to drop out for financial reasons or personal reasons. Yeah, but no, this is specifically, this is not a curriculum driven, you know, program, a four year program. This is only a police academy within the scope. All right. So I, I, I would have to assume that the police is running it on campus. In okay. conjunction with the with the All with right. the university, yeah. Okay. I, I actually, well, I actually have a great idea. You go ahead and send your yes. kids first. All right. <laughs> my kids are they're done. <laughs> yeah, my mine are done. Well, I I think that the you know I I would say that whether they're a college graduate attending college, I think that. One, the conversation about um, about how police are funded, I'll say it that way, um, I think should be added to the conversation as far as how how well they are compensated for the work that they do. I think that also if the relationship between the, the college students and the, the police academy and the police in general have been massaged and nurtured in such a way that people can look at it as an opportunity to being able to serve. Same way as, as I served and that we, you know, me, Gene, uh, and um, Greg served in, in the military and the way that other people serve in, in other different ways. 
that they could do that for a period of four years while they're still pursuing their MBA. Because a lot of law enforcement uh, uh, police departments will pay for post-secondary education. And so Mm -hmm. if you're going through pre-law school or you're going to med school, you're going to whatever school, working at a working a shift as a police department gives you an opportunity to serve, helps you out with your uh, uh, reimbursement for your tuition and improves the community relations. And then it may, you know, so it. I think that there's a lot of benefit to that in the sense of being optimistic of being able to bridge that gap uh, between the way that people view policing um, in general and the way that people view becoming a police officer uh, or serving their community in such a manner. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, Greg just and made was a, a statement. Another issue, I mean, I, I wanted to address, well, Walter, or I just wanted quick, to mention. Let me, let me step back a little bit. Um, yeah. Greg, Greg made a comment in the uh, chat room that pushes on in Charlotte to recruit black officers to patrol the neighborhoods they live in, especially mm-hmm. focusing on the HBCUs. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. We're sure we're here. Greg, he's one of our panelists and he's having mic problems. Uh, we are live, folks. Uh, so when we do the rebroadcast, uh, what we can't edit, we, you know, we can't edit. But anyway, there's one thing that I was very surprised about is that there's a, there's a drop in applications to be a policeman, you know, from the white side anyway. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, one, one city is saying they saw a 75% drop in applications from July through December of 2020. And a lot of officers when I say a lot, I mean, y'all guys can go back and double check this, fact check this as your percentage, because I don't have the percentages with the exception. But there are a lot of, you know, career police officers that are resigning hmm. because they, wow. they, they're just saying, OK, well, you know, I don't want to deal with this or put myself in this position where I can't beat down somebody and, and, and worry about going to jail. So that's what it is. You know, so they, they, they can't use that platform. And I also wanted to mention that, you know, when the Irish came over to the U.S., you know, migrated over here in the late 18, mid to late 1800s, you know, they were treated like dogs. So, I mean, what they did, they joined the police department. So they were, they made up the majority of the police department. Okay. So, and that's why you got a lot of Irish and a lot of Italians who were treated like, you know, like they were black, especially Italian, they were treated like black folk. They joined the police department where they had control. So I did, you know, I read about it, and I did want to share that with the audience uh, in case they didn't know. Y'all guys can probably do some additional research. But that's how they came out of the hole. Mm. Okay. All right. So any questions from the panel? Any words of wisdom for the listeners? I think what Chris had said earlier was very profound and, and, and needs to be adhered to, which is, be completely involved, immersed in the democratic process. Vote, be educated about your vote, uh, but understand who you're voting for, your mayors, your all your, your general assembly, your male district leaders, female district leaders, anybody that you're putting into office, make sure that you understand what they're doing, how they're supposed to do it, and understand your responsibility as a citizen to making sure that they do their jobs they're supposed to do. This is how we get the different attorney generals. You know, when we, we look at good attorney generals, those that, that comes from good elections. You know, saying that comes from good candidates. That goes from, you know, and a good community to continually to su- support their efforts. So make sure that you do that. The primaries have either come for you or they're getting ready to come. Um, there's some gubernatorial elections that are happening this year. The elections are happening, you know, the primary elections are happening either now or throughout this summer during the, the, the general election that happens in November. So if you're not registered to vote, get registered to vote, uh, and, 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 and be immersed and involved in your community. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Anything from you, Gene, before we sign off? Uh, yes. Uh, another yeah, another great show, and unfortunately, it was about another sad topic. Um, uh, Ernest, I still maintain 17, you're a minor. I know you manned up because you're like the most 
macho man I ever met. Like, you're more macho than the guy in a song, macho man. But, you know, at 17, you can't buy cigarettes. But, you know, at a, yeah, but at age 17, you can't buy cigarettes and you damn sure can't buy a drink at a bar. But, you know, um, so I still maintain 17 is a uh, matter of fact, that was what the bail reform and the criminal uh, bill reform in New York was based upon. They were locking up 17 year olds like they did in South Africa during apartheid, because that's where we got the idea from. Ronald Reagan got the idea from South Africa back in the 80s. And, and that's why I maintain that 17 is uh, still uh, a minor. But um, yeah, that was it. Right. Just a, another great show. Another Very sad nice. topic. Awesome. You know, I had to burst. I had to bust Ernest's chops because you know he's army. I'm navy, and I'm better than him. Anyway, <laughs> first of all, I'm a United States Marine. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Let's get the rivalry here. We all guys go to go to yeah. the. Uh, no, does the Marine Corps? Yeah, they have a football go, team, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those those guys were second class citizens on the ship. We basically um made them sit to the taxi back of the drivers. bus. Anyway, I'm out. No, y'all y'all a bunch of taxi <laughs> drivers. That's what y'all. Uh, okay. <laughs> all, day, okay. all right, we got that robbery. We're gonna keep that robbery going, guys. So Michelle, you gonna talk? You gonna tell them about the sports show again that uh, we we're gonna be doing? Yes, yes. So we have the NFL draft coming up, right? So Christopher and Greg, our panel members, will be doing a recorded show on uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday coming at 10 a.m., and then a post show of the NFL draft on Cinco de Mayo, which is Wednesday, May 5th, hump day, at 6 p.m. We will have a live show via Zoom, and um, all is welcome. We will post it on the Walt Weekly website and uh, social media pages, so everyone could get the link for that. So anyone that's football fans, we'd love to have you guys next week, Wednesday, if you're available. Yes, 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 and please send your information so we can get that link out, or you can check the link. We can put that link on on, on Insta, right, on Instagram? And they can yes, they can use all our social media. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure they get the invite. Mark your calendars. Yeah. yeah, right. We'll get the invite to you, but mark your calendars if you want to talk about some football stuff, the NFL post, uh, post NFL. Yeah, draft. we want to get a little lighter. Yes, we've been Wednesday. we've been in the dark for a long time, and yeah, we want to come out a little bit out and get some get some fresh air, and then we're going back in. All right, so that'll be yeah. our you know our right. escape for a little bit. That'll be. Yes, exactly. So, Walter, you want to close it out or you want me to close uh, it out? Yeah, I just want to just let them know that uh, we will be doing a rebroadcast of this live uh, show on Sunday. And you're going to see it on all the various platforms where you get find your, your podcast, such as Apple, Google Play, uh, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, you can find the Walt Weekly Podcast. And that will be released on Sunday evening. And I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and you can take us out. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, thank you, Walter. Thank you, Ernest, Honorable Dean, Christopher, for joining us, our panel members, as always, and Greg in the chat room. We appreciate you guys. Thank you to our sponsors, Soap and Love, Beauty Blends by Ami, and Michelle Sweeney here. Um, thank you for joining the Walt Weekly to our audience. We appreciate you on the live. Please follow the Walt Weekly. You can find us at www.thewaltweekly.com, IG and Facebook. The Walt Weekly, Twitter, Walt Weekly, Podbeam, The Walt Weekly, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and other streaming platforms. Have an awesome weekend. Be safe. And God bless. Yes, God bless. Have a good night, son. All right. Bye-bye. Good night.